But I think there's a lot of teams around Tanafin. I mean, around Tanafin. I should call them that. <laughs> Tanafin. I think there's a lot of teams around Tanafin. 32 Thoughts, back with you again, presented as always by the GMC Sierra. Someone, Elliot, has been with us from pretty much day one and have always continued to support us. So for that, we say thank you for helping to keep the lights on around the place. Merrick Friedman and Dom Shramati along with you. A little bit later on, you'll hear from Kyle Connor uh, and Connor Hellebuck of the Winnipeg Jets. You know, before Sunday, I was saying, you know what? That Winnipeg-Vancouver game was the game of the weekend. And then I saw the Rangers and the Islanders on Sunday, Elliot, and they may have different thoughts. We'll get to all of this coming up in a moment. Uh, but this is a show where we have to talk about Yarmir Yager. And number 68 finally finds its rightful place in the rafters. Um, the, listen, the, the speech was wonderful. Uh, the warm-up was great with yeah. everybody with the mullets. And Yager comes out to, to take warm-up, which was such a wonderful touch there as well. Um, I don't know. I, I don't want to drill down right away, but just sort of wide brush thoughts on on everything that we saw Yager on Sunday. Well, I, I think you should bring it before Sunday, starting from Friday when he did the Fan Fest, and then Saturday when he went on the ice for practice and Latang talked about how much he idolized him and wanted him to autograph the jersey. Initially, you know, he had said he didn't want to go on the ice for practice because he wanted didn't want to be a distraction. And Mike Sullivan said, don't be ridiculous. You're not a distraction. The speech I thought was phenomenal. It was typical Jagger. Uh, the shot at all Samuelson say something nice about me, but I couldn't think of anything. Um, it, it, talking about Bob Johnson, it's a great day for hockey, but now it's a great day for me. And saying, I don't know how long I can talk, but it's my day, so I'll take as long as I want. Um, men mentioning Mike Lang, uh, mentioning everybody who was there, making everybody feel important. The line about his girlfriend being too young to see him in Pittsburgh. Um, you know, it was it, like they knocked it out of the park. They didn't just knock it out of the park. Jeff, do you remember Jose Canseco's home Fifth run deck, off Mike Flanagan Fifth decker. in the... Yep. In, in the then Sky yep. Dome in the 1989 playoffs. Like, that's what that was. That was a fifth deck blast uh, in, a, in a stadium. It was it was a massive, massive hit. And, and the guy who I really wanted to shout out was Phil Bork. Because you'll remember a year and a half ago when the outdoor game involved the Penguins, uh, we interviewed Phil Bork, who'd kind of begun the field recon to get Yaramir Yager to agree to come back to Pittsburgh and have his number retired. And Phil Bork really worked towards this. And he, and Yager showed, uh, shouted him out too, saying, you know, Phil was the guy who showed him how to have a good time in Pittsburgh. And I, I thought a lot about Bork and how much he wanted to help make this happen. It was a great, great weekend. The shot of Ron Francis, Lemieux, and Yager at dinner, um, everything about that, and getting Sidney Crosby to wear a mullet during warm-up and Crosby doing his routine with so the good. mullet on. Everything about it, everything about it was spectacular. Everything. And someone mentioned to me, if you're going to shout out anybody from the Penguins organization, you should shout out uh, Kevin Acklin, uh, Kevin is the president of business operations. And he's an alternate governor. He sat at the podium when Yager met with the media on Sunday morning. And they said that Acklin was given the responsibility of making sure this worked. And a lot of it worked because of who Yager is and the love that the organization, the players and the fans have towards him and Yager's own ability to grasp the moment. But Acklin was the guy who was sort of behind it, making it all work. So I think Phil Bork, I'll shout out. Acklin, I'll shout out. And of course, Yager and the Penguins fans. The Penguins fans helped make... I saw the lineups, like even before the ceremony began, they embraced it. I think what this does, Jeff, is it's a reminder that... And I think this is very important for people to remember... We don't often get to write our own exits. No matter how much we've given to a company we work for or whether it's a relationship that goes sideways, 
In life, we don't often get to write our own exits. But what we forget and what we need to remember is that time can heal. It doesn't always heal, but it can heal. And I think there was a lot that happened. Like Yarmir Yager, for everything he did in Pittsburgh, and there's a couple of moments we'll talk about, um, he should never have been forgotten. Like even if he went and went and played for half the league after he left, it shouldn't have mattered. It shouldn't have mattered. You know, he got traded. Things changed. That happens. But it's always a reminder that we need time to have things heal. And I'm glad it happened. And I'm glad everybody made it work because it was a spectacular weekend, a smashing success. I only have two minor complaints. (laughs) Number one, I wish it wouldn't have happened on the same day as the Rangers Islander outdoor game. I think both those things deserve their own pure 100% spotlight. And number two, the Penguins lost to the Kings. You cannot lose that game. <laughs> but Crosby scored. You have to but Crosby win scored. That game. Sydney Crosby scored. Does that not count? Crosby scored in the game, though, Elliot. Are, yeah, I'm sure. You, I, I bet you if you went into the room right after and you went to Crosby and say, hey, team lost, but you scored. Are you okay with this? I'm sure that would go over really yeah, well. That's Crosby. That's Crosby. You know, I think that we were all sort of um, when Yager made his comeback and. You know, chose Philadelphia over Pittsburgh, and he commented on that. And he talked about, you know, Sid has his own line, and Malkin has his own line, and I needed to carve out something else for myself. I think that we all wondered because this is around, you know, two eleven, two twelve, two thirteen, and on. Yeah, it did it almost not feel to you like to your point about Yager going through half the league. Did it not feel like every year he was going to join a different team and help a younger player? Like he goes to Philadelphia and all of a sudden, like it's, you know, there to help shepherd Claude Giroux and he's into Dallas and he's there shepherding Jamie Benn, a very young Jamie Benn at that point, 22 years old, I think. And then into Boston with Brad Marchand, et cetera. Like, did you not get the sense that Yager was going like almost like a, like a Kwai Chang Kane from Kung Fu going from team to team to sprinkle sort of, you know, magic yogurt dust everywhere to the younger players. That's how it felt to me when he came back. Well, I just think he loves hockey, right? As he said, like it, it is proof that he absolutely loves hockey. And I think that's all part of the package. And let me say again, one more time, he should be the three-year mandatory non-playing period should be waived for him. He should be inducted immediately because, as we all know, he's playing to keep his old team alive. And nothing shows his love for hockey more than that. And I I, I know it won't work, and I know nobody will listen, but he should be immediately elected and inducted into the they hockey They were making hall of that fame. same point on the broadcast tonight, saying that there's uh, you know, there's no reason why the Hockey Hall of Fame Was that before wave. or after Yager swore? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. I can only imagine Josh gets off his face, though. You know, he was, you know, he understood my um, language barrier. So we were... So, oh, Sorry. <laughs> genuine. I'm more, I'm more nervous than I play. Like the player came out and you right there. Was like, sorry, I was just like. All you can do is laugh. All you could do is. You laugh. know what? One thing, and that's a great moment. One thing that I thought of this weekend is a story that Brian Burke told me about interviewing Yager, and this is the 1990 draft. So he had been working for Pat Quinn and the Vancouver Canucks. He said, um, as part of the interview. He said to Yager, how many teams have you captained growing up? And Yager said, none. And Berkey said sort of around the table, that was like, oh, that's a red flag. Is there a you know, personality issue there? Is there a selfish issue there? Like, what's the issue with Yager, with the supreme talent? How come he's never captained a team growing up? And then Yager paused and said, because I was always playing two or three years up. So I was always too young to be the captain of a team. <laughs> and Bert goes, okay, yeah, just wave that whole captain's thing. We won't worry about that. But it almost seemed as if, you know, everything that he achieved in the NHL and, you know, one day it will culminate going into the Hockey Hall of Fame. But as for the purposes of this podcast, getting his number 68 retired, it almost seemed like he was sort of destined for this kind of greatness really early on in his life, Elliot. Uh, Look, I I think when you have the work ethic that he has, I have heard people say before, Jeff, that working hard is not a skill. I a billion percent disagree with that because if working hard was not a skill, everybody would do it. 
And, you know, we, I guarantee to you, you have met a lot of people who don't work that hard, especially in our business. You meet a lot of people in our business who have the ability, but don't want to work or do the work. So I really do believe that there is a skill to it. And he clearly has had that skill all his life. And I think, especially as he got older, one of the reasons that he lasted as long as he did and as successfully as he did was because of that work ethic and that commitment to training. Now, favorite Yager moments. What were yours? Ooh, uh, watching him dance through the Chicago Blackhawks was really, really special. Although, you know what? A lot of my Yager moments, uh, as well as much as a lot of them are wrapped up with the Pittsburgh Penguins, and there certainly are plenty, um, a lot of my Yager moments are actually with the Rangers. And you know what? Him playing with Michael Nylander. You know, remember when the Rangers went through, like, this experiment where they would bring in, like, a different center for him to play with? almost like trying to find magic slippers. They just kept bringing in a different center after a different center after a different center to try to find who could play with them. And it turns out like the only guy who really could was Michael Nylander. Those are some of my great Yager memories. But as far as the Penguins go, just, okay, just so watching. Okay, Penguins fans. Sorry, Penguins just, fans. Just reach out to Jeff Merrick <laughs> on social for Yager's number retirement, and we talk about the Rangers. You know, that's at Jeff Yeah, Merrick. you got me there. Um, but as far as Penguins. But the Chicago the, goal is the your Chica right. The Chica because what, I dancing was, Blackhawks to me was, that, that to me was like the supreme Yager moment. But you know what? Like, I look at all the stars of that era, and Yager was such a big target. That like when you are large and can move like that, you get chopped and whacked and slashed and hooked and cross checked. Like you look at the gauntlet that guy had to go through. Mario was the same way to get the ice that he needed to get to to score and to create. That to me is like, you know, you were talking about working hard as a skill. You're right. There's a saying pain now or pain later. Like everything that Yager did with Pittsburgh, he went through hell to pile up like 149 points and 127 points and 102 points. Those all came with bruises. There was like no easy runway to the net when Yager played at all. And he was large. So everybody could get a lick in on him. I've always felt that with like smaller players and shifty players, you know, kind of hard to hit, kind of get to, tough to get a piece of. Yager was big and guys clubbed him every chance they got. To me, his is the story of of endurance as much as it is skill. Well, endurance in terms of that and how long he lasted. I'll just mention that Chicago goal because, as you know, I used to be a big Blackhawk fan. They go to that Stanley Cup final. That's game one of the series. The Penguins are the lethal team. They're the defending champions. They're the huge favorites. I remember thinking, if the Blackhawks steal game one, maybe we've got a chance here. And it's 4-1, to one and they come back. And that was the tying goal at 4-4. Four, four. And when he scored that goal, I was like, yeah, that was nice. And then it, it was nice to actually think that the Blackhawks had a chance in this series. And then Lemieux scored in the last minute uh, on a, uh, on a, off a faceoff. And I remember just that game hit zero and it was over. And I said, I can't believe I actually thought the Blackhawks had a chance <laughs> to win this series. Uh yeah, it was just uh, the race for who the runner-up was going to be, kind of like during those uh, Islanders dynasties as well. Uh, there were a few teams that you know got close but got a little bit too close to the sun and then got burned, same way with the Pittsburgh Penguins. Congratulations to number 68. It is, Elliot, where it very much belongs. Yeah. Also on Sunday, a great outdoor game, a great stadium series game, a great comeback game, a, a, a rookie lap from Matt Rempe, and then a great fight with Matt Martin and Matt Rempe. We haven't seen a player make a debut at an outdoor game until Sunday afternoon. Uh, there was a wonderful moment before the game where Mark Messier and Mike Keenan were brought into the room. This is 30 years after 1994, of course. And there was so, and then the game itself, like from the opening puck drop, just flat out delivered Elliot. There was so much to like about that game. Even like, even the most cynical 
hockey fan, even the biggest Ranger Islander haters out there have to look at that game and say, wow, that was really something. Well, I think you have to add the the, the Devils and the Flyers to it because I thought the weekend was, was hugely successful. And I, I heard from a couple of people who had their first outdoor game experiences. And, and they said to me that it is true what we say on this pod. And that is that this is not for the TV viewer. This is for the people who go to the game. You, If you go to one of these games and you have a bad time, chances are you're the problem. Uh, because so many people I know go to these games and they love it. It doesn't matter how cold it is. It doesn't matter if the game's great. It's just the experience. And the NHL's done a really good job of learning how to put on a show around the game. Can you, you can have fun during the whole event. That's that's what they've gotten much better at doing. And I, and I thought the whole weekend was fantastic. You know, Panarin, he's at his career high for goals. He tied it. That overtime winner tied it, 32. And by the way, the, the moment that puck went in, I knew that was a goal. Uh, you know, the NHL has continuation. If the net comes off, but the shot goes either directly in or as that shot did, it hits the goaltender and goes in, that's a goal. And so I, I had no doubt about that. That's a devastating loss for the Islanders and their fans, a huge win for the Rangers and their fans, a big win for the Devils who are right back on the precipice mm-hmm. of the playoffs. Like, like just massively entertaining weekend between the Flyers coming in as Rocky, the Devils coming in as the Sopranos, and Tyler Toffoli looking actually like he was a character on the series, to the Rangers coming in in the uniforms of... Uh, the police and the fire department to the Islanders coming in as the Islanders. And, you know, I I have to say this. (laughs) I saw, I saw two really opposite takes, like how sad it was that Lou Lamorello uh, didn't let the Islanders pick something different to how funny it was that Lou Lamorello made the Islanders stick to the script. Mm -hmm. It was like, I, I saw some Islanders fans who were kind of like, you know what, this fits for us. And I saw a lot of other people were like, oh, man, this is terrible. But, you know, what's worse for the Islanders fans was the loss. That that should have been that should have been a W for them. But it was it was a great weekend. You know, the, the only thing I'm sitting here with the Rangers right now, and, I, like, I like a, a lot of the way that they're going. This whole Shesterkin thing to me, Um, it's taken him longer to find his game than I thought it would. Like, I I still stand by my feelings here, which is that he's their number one guy, and you're going as far as you can based on where he takes you, but it's taking longer than I thought for him to get back to himself. That's, That's the only thing that concerns me about the Rangers. Other than that, I... I really like their team. Uh, they're a lot of fun. A lot of dynamic personalities, some great players. As you mentioned, Artemi Panarin, who is one of my favorite players in the game. I'll tell you what, on that Panarin on that Panarin goal, I felt real bad for Noah Dobson. That's the one guy. Like, oh, I, he's, I, had he's had a marvelous season. He's had an awesome, Fantastic awesome season. season, and people are talking about him. You know, He's going to get some – he's not going to win the trophy, but he's going to get some Norris consideration. He's going to get some down-ballot love, certainly. I felt really bad for him on that one, man. I felt so bad for Noah Dobson. Uh, on that play, just knowing what a what a, a great season he's had. You know what? The best players they have the puck on their stick all the time. Yeah, it, you know you're going to make mistakes. It happens. Like I remember talking to Steve Nash about this. Steve Nash was always very high on the NBA list in turnovers, and once he said to me, he goes, "I have the ball all the time. It's going to happen." Yeah, I just, I love that. Like I I, I love the way he said. It. He says. You know, the guy's in the Hall of Fame, or he's going to be in the Hall of Fame. Even Hall of Famers make mistakes. You know, further to, I may pick up a point you made about Artemi Panarin. And, you know, we just finished talking about Yarmir Yager and a lot of the the young players that he helped during his during his comeback um, to the NHL. You know, everywhere Artemi Panarin goes, he makes everybody around him better. I guess the hallmark of one of the great players. I mean, Gretzky was the best at this, you know, better than anybody else. But, you know, Artemi Panarin has helped either 
resuscitate, rejuvenate, or create a lot of careers that are still with us in the NHL. And the most recent one is certainly Alexi Lafreniere, um, but he's not the only one. Like, I, I can't help but wondering if, you know, somewhere down the road, and I cross my fingers just because I want Artemi Panarin in the league for a long time, if he just turns into that guy by the end, like Artemi Panarin, like, assumes that mentor's role for someone, uh, you know, maybe every different season, every couple of seasons, just assumes a mentor's role in the NHL because Elliot isn't the story of Artemi Panarin the guy who makes everybody else around him better. Like you keep hearing like, oh, this guy is so easy to play with. This made the, this guy made the game easy. Does anybody in the NHL make the game easier than Artemi Panarin? Ask all the guys. It's Would you breeze. say Patrick Kane? Well, Kane is one of them too. And that's what those two guys were so, with such butter on the, on the Chicago Blackhawks. But Patrick Kane is clearly one of those guys too. But Panarin is just... Like we were talking about Alexi Lafreniere being traded, and you know, this is the last gasp now for Alexi Lafreniere. And much like you know, any other problem, the solution is always put him with Panarin. He's just that guy in the NHL. He makes everybody better, everyone around him better. And that was on on display once again at a glorious outdoor game. And you know what? The the one thing that I will take um, slight exception with, and generally you're right, like these aren't made for tv games the viewing experience isn't as good as the live experience but i thought that rangers islanders game came off great on tv whether it was the colors whether it was just the play i thought it came off great i really did i thought it was excellent there's something about those games when they get played in the late afternoon when it switches from light to darkness that does look very good. Uh, I've seen that happen a few times, and I've been at a couple where that happened. It does look really good when you sort of get into that late afternoon transition. I believe. I would just say for the most part, when you go to those games, it's more about the event than the game. I That's think true. for the TV viewer, it's more about the game than the event. Um, so it's it's very, very different experiences. Now, they awarded the 2026 All-Star Game to Long Island. Yep. And I, I believe the Islanders have been pushing quite hard for this um, because they, you know, obviously they've got the new arena, which is beautiful. And they're, they're working on the areas around the arena, um, which the NHL has been very impressed with. And uh, so I'm not surprised the Islanders got it. You know, a couple other things here. I, I had a couple of fans who DM'd me and asked me, what about Detroit? I think Detroit is very much on the radar. Uh, one of the things I've kind of been told there is that the Red Wings are working on some things in the area. And the, some of the talk has been about, do they wait until all of that is finished before they get a game? So I do think Detroit is very much on the radar, but I think it's come down to, um, like I said, some. I don't know enough about this. Red Wings fans probably know better than me, but there are some projects they've been working on around there, and the debate has been, do you wait until that's all done? I think also Edmonton is uh, kind of on the radar too. They have a new arena as well that they'd love to show off. You know, is it anti-Canadian to say that Edmonton in February might be a little bit of a concern? But I do think Edmonton is is on the radar. The other thing you know, I'm, I'm kind of uh, hearing about here is, um, is, is the awards. And I, I think that, like they announced the overseas games as well. Um, next year in Finland and Germany. But one of the things is 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 kind of the awards in, in the sense that um, I think they're talking about, because th this year, the seventh game of the Stanley Cup final could be really late and it's very quick into the draft. So I, I think one of the things that's kind of been discussed is, um, are there a couple of awards that are done right around the draft since we're going to be in Vegas? And what someone told me on the weekend from one of the NHL teams is that one of the ideas that's been thrown around is, you know, the NBA, when someone wins an award and their team is in the playoffs, they have a press conference unveiling the award uh, during the day and then, or the day before the game, and then, you know, you kind of reward the player with a big ovation in front of their fans. And I don't necessarily think they do that with one of the big ones, like the heart or anything like that. But some teams told me that they were asked about 
Um, what if we do that like in the first round of the playoffs? Does that make any sense? And so I think that's kind of being thrown around there. I think that's a very interesting idea because it sounds like a big award show uh, isn't in the cards this year. So if Minnesota makes it in, then you award the Lady Bing to Marc-Andre Fleury game one of the playoffs then? Assuming he's still there, <laughs> yes. You're, I know you're not giving up on this campaign. We'll talk about that at a different time. Maybe even on today's podcast, but we still have plenty more to get to. That's an interesting note uh, about the awards and uh, um, some speculation as well uh, about the Islanders hosting in 2026. How much of a factor with all of this with the Islanders do you think the presence of John Collins is? I, I'm sure it has uh, a lot to do with it. Um He's got a lot of great ideas. He works for the Islanders organization. He used to work at the NHL. Um, he's got a lot of ideas. He's excellent, very creative. And uh, uh, I would think that he will come up with a lot of ideas that the league will like to see. You know, this will be the first time, I think, that we've had an all-star game in the year where we've also gone to the Olympics, right? And so I, I think they're looking at this as kind of the gateway to the Olympics. And it makes sense. The Olympics are in Italy and, you know, you go to New York first and then you send the group off to Italy. And so I, I think that's going to be part of it is, you know, kind of the big gateway to Milan. And I'm curious to see what they come up with there. Okay, gateway to the Hart Trophy. Um, don't look now, but Austin Matthews just had another hat trick, his sixth hat trick of the season, and is now up to 48 goals. Elliot Friedman, as we talk about the McKinnons and the Kucherovs, and can McDavid get there and get in the conversation for the Hart Trophy? Uh, he's got 48 goals. Elliot, what's going to get him into heart conversation? Well, I, I look, he's on pace for 75. It, 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 there hasn't been a lot of talk with Matthews for the Hart Trophy, right? Like most of the Hart Trophy talk, and deservedly so, has been around McKinnon or Kucherov or Panarin or McDavid. But, by the way, did you not love McDavid's celebration after Bouchard won the game the other day in Dallas? That was pretty hilarious. But if Matthew scored 75 goals, he's going to win the Hart. If you look back at the history of 70 goals in this league in the MVP, Esposito, MVP, Gretzky, MVP all those years, Curry, well, Gretzky got the MVP, he passed it to him. Lemieux, the first time he scored 70, he was MVP. Um... Lemieux scored 85, wasn't MVP, but that was the same year as Nichols. He scored 70. Who passed it to him? Gretzky. So he was MVP. Hull, 86 goals, MVP. The other two years he scored 70. He wasn't, but he 86, he was the MVP. Soft. And McG <laughs> McG McGillney and Solani, the year they scored 76, yeah. the MVP was Mario who had 69 in 60 games. He had 69 and 160 <laughs> points in 60 games. So I kind of understand why the voters yeah. went there. Yeah, I get but it. what it tells me, what it tells me is that if you score 70 or 75, uh -huh. you're winning MVP in this league. And also about the Leafs, Bettman's appeal uh, ruling on the Riley appeal is due today. Uh, okay, let's get to a couple of things you talked about on Saturday. I want to get to uh, noted U2 hater. You know, what, you, know what, you know what Connor Hellebach wins? What's that? Glengarry Glenn Ross. Set of steak knives. Steak knives. knives. Third place. Third place. Fired. You're fired. <laughs> <laughs> I feel sorry for the person who finishes third in heart voting behind Matthews and Hellebach. Put the coffee down. Okay. Uh, some things from Saturday. Uh, Noah Hannafin going to market. This little defenseman is going to market. What's going on with Calgary? <laughs> that's, that, that's pretty good, I, I have to say. Thought I um, heard you say that on Saturday. You know, I, uh, I, I really feel for the Flames and everyone around them. I, I really do. I don't want to talk about them. Um, to be honest, the last two weeks, I've kind of wanted to stay away from them. I, I really do think after a while it becomes, um, it, it's not enjoyable. Like, I, I don't think like, like, you know me, Jeff, I love talking hockey. I love talking about what's going on. It's my job, but it's, it's not enjoyable to keep talking about or keep, you know, for lack of a better term, picking apart the same team all the time. And last week, I didn't really want to talk about them. But then the Markstrom thing with the Devils came to you, and you can't ignore that. 
And this week, I didn't want to talk about him. But then, you know, every you talk to a whole bunch of teams, and it's like everyone's waiting uh, on the Flames to decide what they're going to do. And it's pretty clear what's going on with Hannafin, that he's going to market. Now, the, the team doesn't want to talk about it, and the, the agent doesn't want to talk about it. And I think it's because... You know, the, the the Flames were going really well, and then the, the Markstrom thing got out, and it's, it's you know, Ron and Kelly were basically saying on Saturday night how they think it's really fouled up their season. And I think the Flames are also trying to protect some of their players, particularly Markstrom, and, you know, who is not a UFA. And, you know, I, I just think they want to calm the noise around their team. And it's just so hard to do it. But look, it's it's pretty clear Hannafin's going to market. We know Tanev's going to be traded. I think Markstrom is frustrated, but he's basically says, you bring me something and I'll consider it. You know, so I think that's where we are. Um, when it comes to Tanev, I think the I think the Flames are waiting till a first round pick gets offered. Uh, I think that's what they're waiting for. And if a team steps up with a first rounder, I could see it happening. And I think there's a pretty big group there. It's it's Toronto, which I think is offering multiple picks, but none of them are first. And their first second available isn't for four years. Um, so that's a challenge. It's Toronto. It's Dallas. I think Colorado's in there. Um, Edmonton and Vancouver. Vancouver, I think it's very hard for them to do. But I think they like the idea of it and they would really prefer Edmonton not get them. Like, I think with Edmonton, it's all coming down to what they think they want to do. Like, what is their number one thing that they decide to go after? And they still have a little bit of time to figure it out here. Um, but that's like, they're, they're going to take a swing. Um, you know, Ken Holland has joked before, nobody's traded more first round picks than him. And this is a go for it team and a go for it year. So they're going to do it again, probably. So I think he's looking at it like, what am I going to do it on? And so that's part of this. But I think there's a lot of teams around Tanifin. I mean, around Tanifin. Tan I should call them that, <laughs> Tanifin. I think there's a lot of teams around Tanifin. I think there's a lot of teams around Tanev, and I think the number of teams around Hannafin is growing because now they see where this is going. I think a team like Toronto would love to get Hannafin, but I don't believe, like I said this last summer, that I think Hannafin's uh, position was to go to the States if he hit the market, and the U.S.-based teams certainly think that. Like They think that if he goes to the market – they're going to have the better chance of getting them than Toronto or anyone else. So, uh, you know, I, I think the market for Hannafin is growing. And, you know, we'll see. Uh, we'll see where that goes from here. But, boy, I wish I could stop talking about the Flames because uh, it, it, it's too much, and I think it's bad for their players and for them too. I think it's a lot to handle. Uh, it's a lot, but you, uh, listen, you, pl you play the course, right? You play what's in front of you. What can you, what, what, what can you do? I think we're all sort of wondering, you know, okay, where's the, where's the fit for Hannafin? Um, you know, I wonder, even though Dallas is probably looking for a right shot D, would, did, uh, would they be interested in Noah Hannafin? And they just lost y Yanni Hockenpah. Uh, I want, uh, I'll tell you what, I don't know how they would do it by way of what they would have to give or how they could fit in. Um, but my first thought hearing you talk about that on Saturday, Elliot, with the Tampa Bay Lightning. Like, you know, they're not going to throw in towel. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know how that would possibly work. But you know that Julian Brisebois might, you know. Well, the they also don't have them. a lot to give up. That's what like, I'm saying. They're in the same boat as I Toronto. I don't know how they would. Have, I don't know how they would make it work. But you know there would be interest, especially now with the injuries. So that's an intriguing one. That one's uh, and, and I still, uh, I'll still, I know that Siegenthaler is back and, and skating with the team, having his first few skates. But I do wonder about New Jersey, with uh, with Noah Hannafin as well. Yeah, New Jersey's a fair one too. Like. Like I think Toronto, like I think Toronto and Tampa are kind of in the same boat. Like they don't have, like the the biggest problem is they don't have a lot of assets they can or want to move. I think Boston and Florida are a little bit different because if they wanted to, they have they don't have a ton of picks, but they have young players. 
Like that Lundell has been thrown into some things this year. And like, I, I don't know that Florida wants to do that, but if they did, they could. And Boston has players that they could move to. They don't have a lot of picks, but they have players. And that I think, so I think Florida and Boston are a little ahead of Tampa and Toronto in terms of what they can do or they might be willing to do. Hey, we just mentioned Florida and Tampa there a couple of seconds ago. How about that game on Saturday? Like emphatic. Oh my God, nine nine to Florida Panthers. Uh, uh, Jonah Gadjevich with two separate fights, one with uh, Watson, one with Chernak. That was, oof, Kachuk with four points, Ben with four points, two goals and two assists each. That was, like, there's very few times on the calendar you can send a message. That was one of them by the Florida Panthers. Like, there is no they, there is no denying how good Florida is. And that was in Tampa, Elliot. Yeah, Florida's a hell of a team. They, they are really good. Uh, they're, they're the best team in the Eastern Conference, I, I really think. And, you know, once again, I think a key, a key is Stolars uh, in, in the sense that what did we learn last year? We're reminded last year about Bobrovsky is you can't overplay him. You know, you you have to get him on a routine where his body can recover and and, and he can, you know, he can properly rest in between games. And Stolars has given them a lot of good goaltending this year. That makes them better. Ekman Larson has been a huge find for him. I actually feel a bit bad for Ekman Larson. He was so good the first couple months of the season. Then Ekblad and 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 uh, Montour came back and he lost time. But he's been good. There, are, All their best players have been good. You know, last year's Stanley Cup finalists, you take a look at Vegas and you take a look at Florida, both those teams have big-time UFAs. Like, Vegas has Marcia So, they have uh, Carrier, they have Chandler Stevenson. Like, those are important players on that team. And Florida's obviously got Reinhardt, and they've got Montour, and they've got Forsling. And like I think both those teams have tried to sign those players. Um, you know, Vegas. I've heard that you know the 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 Golden Knights are very careful with term, like a lot of teams are I, with players who get older. You know, Florida. I think Bill Zito. You know, he's been an agent before. He knows all the tricks of the trade. He's a grinder. He's trying to create. Uh, a situation where we're like the lightning people take less to play for us, uh, things like that. And so uh, to this point, as we recorded this pod, nothing's done there to me, both those teams, unless something drops on their lap, that's better than what they've got. I just think you go for it with those guys and sort it out in June. If you have to, you know, you just say, all right, we're going for it. We'll, We'll deal with things as they happen after the season with some of the some of these UFAs. Like, you know, McCrimmon and Zito, they're both really tough negotiators. They've rewarded people who they feel deserve to be rewarded. It's not like they're unreasonable, but, you know, they're tough negotiators. And I think the Golden Knights are careful about term. And I think the Panthers, like, like I said, I think Zito is just a former agent, knows all the tricks, grinder, grinder, grinder. And... You know, I wonder how much business these guys get done before the deadline or they just say, you know what, we're going for it and we'll deal with it. And if I was in both their shoes, that's what I would do. Speaking of business, um, with both parties in the same place last week, i.e. management and agent, do you think the Sean Walker business took a step forward? Like Keith Jones, Daniel Briere, Cam Stewart, who's the agent, uh, all chatted before the Philadelphia Flyers Toronto Maple Leafs game. Yeah, were you stalking their got, meeting I got on Thursday morning in Elliot. Toronto? I got, uh, I got my tentacles all over the place. <laughs> and I don't think that, you know, anything definite came out of it, but I just can't help but thinking that at, at least, you know, the conversation was moved forward. Does the Ristolainen injury uh, complicate things or maybe make things easier? We'll see. Um, but it very much feels like, I mean, obviously this is going to come to some type of crescendo by trade deadline on March 8th, if there's not an extension before that, but it, it kind of feels like at least both sides have had, you know, some, a little bit of face time with each other. I think that there's a, a feeling that, you know, any contract is probably between four to 5 million, uh, per season term will probably be an issue as is usually an issue. Um, but does it feel like the the Walker situation in Philly is is starting to, 
come a little bit more into focus? I think there was a time where people thought that the Drysdale acquisition pushed Walker out. I, I definitely believe that the thinking has changed there. Um, I do think they're, t- and I was one of those people too. I, I got those signals that Drysdale pushes out Walker. I'm no longer as certain about that. Now, I think Philly's going to want a number in the mid to low fours. Like I know you wrote in your Ring for Eyes blog that at four to five, I think if it gets closer to five, I think it's going to be tougher for Philly to do. But if it's mid to low fours, I, I could see that getting done now. I, I think it's really fascinating. Like Philly, they're like again, they're they're playing cards. They're they're playing poker. They're trying to sign people, but they're saying, hey, there's a limit. And but they're also setting high prices on guys. It's almost like they're waiting to see. I said this last pod, almost waiting to see what happens first. We get what we want or the player signs. But I think in Walker's case, the pendulum has definitely swung to we'd prefer to keep him. Um, I think one of the reasons is, you know, Drysdale is a super talented player, but he's still very young and is and is learning how to defend. And I think they just feel if Walker leaves, Drysdale is going to be asked to do some things he isn't ready to do yet. So that I do think is part of this process. So... Yes, but I think it's got to be at Philly's number. What one of the things that I that I've always believed here is that if the Philadelphia Flyers, because I, I look at you know what you're replacing Sean Walker with, so if the Flyers get offered a first round pick, I mean, there's a really really good chance that that's going to turn into an NHL player. But if that's a third or fourth round pick, there's no guarantees that that's going to be a player. And it probably makes more sense for Philly to hang on to him, even if he's not going to get signed, for example, to keep him for this run, whatever this run turns into. You know what I mean? Like one way or the other, they want to get either someone that can guarantee will play in the NHL or keep him for whatever this run turns into. Do you agree with that? Well, I think the other thing, too, with the cap going up, it's going to be easier to move players in theory. That That's another factor here. It's that... If things go to where we all think this is supposed to go, we should be able to see more movement. Like, like I'll be honest, with Hannafin, one manager predicted to me that he would sign in Calgary, and then in three, four years, if it didn't work, they could just move him. Now, it doesn't look like that's happening, but that's what that manager predicted was going to happen. He actually called me on Sunday to say he was surprised. That that didn't that isn't what worked out. Um, anything else on the Edmonton Oilers? You mentioned them earlier. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that's that's pretty clear with uh, Edmonton is that um, I don't think they're going to add a goalie. Uh, just in trying to figure out what they were doing, I, I think they're looking at forwards. I think they're looking at some D. I think Holland's going to take a swing, and. But I think I don't, it doesn't sound like they're doing a lot of goaltending. And I think the re now, if they suffer an injury, that's something else entirely. Then the whole picture changes, you know, knock on wood, that doesn't happen. I don't like to say that happened to anyone, but I just don't think they feel that it makes sense for them to move an asset or rejuggle their lineup for goaltending as long as Skinner is on point. And, you know, because one of the things there is that for every dollar that comes in, they're going to have to move money out. So last year to do Ekholm, they had to tr- include Barry in that deal and they had to move Pugliarvi in another deal, right? So I think that's what they're looking at. They're saying for every move that comes in, somebody is going off that roster. And I think they look at it as let's take the biggest swing we can and not waste any of our assets either to make a trade or to move someone or to do whatever in that unless something different happens. And by the way, something else you wrote in your Rink Fries blog I agree with, Mark Hunter and Columbus it makes a lot of sense because of the connections, but I do think that Ken Holland's future in Edmonton could tie into Mark Hunter's future 
in the NHL. Well, and that's why when I spoke to John Davidson on Friday on the radio show, he mentioned, you know, maybe, you know, maybe you might have to get someone so another team doesn't get them right yeah. away. Yeah. My first thought was, uh, is this JD code for Mark Hunter? <laughs> I, I <laughs> so liked his use of the, the word blog. malarkey. Oh, uh, thank you. And I, I, I made, met, met, make sure I made mention of it at the end. I have not, I can't remember the last time I heard the word malarkey, but bless John Davidson for using the word malarkey. Uh, taking us all back and making us feel old, Elliot Freeman, but I do love and miss that word, and let's bring that up, J.D. Um, okay, uh, let's finish off with this one. The Andrew Burnett story with you 2 and the sphere and the guys thinking about vacations and the dusting by the Dallas Stars. Uh, you tied this one up pretty interestingly on Saturday. You want to recount for people that weren't with us? Sure. Um, so basically what happens is they come back from the All-Star break. Brunette says their Monday practice is terrible. Tuesday, they play at home to the Devils. They lose 4-2. to two. And then on Thursday, they lose to Dallas in embarrassing fashion, 9-2. to two. And Brunette says something about the end of the game, about their minds are on vacations. And I thought they were talking about their vacations over All-Star, except for Forsberg, because he was obviously at the game. Uh, but I checked, I asked around and somebody told me, no, it it wasn't that. It was this trip to Vegas. So on Saturday, they played St. Louis in St. Louis. And by the way, I think, never mind, I think, they were livid about that Jordan Bennington play with Evangelista. Bennington oh, got, yeah, he yeah. got fined five thousand dollars, but the Predators were livid about that play. Anyway, um, so they played St. Louis on Saturday afternoon. They won that game five to two, but their next game is Tuesday in Vegas. So the players had asked for permission to fly to Vegas early after that game on Saturday and go see U two at the Sphere, and that show ends on March second. So it was going to be one of the last shows, or and so. They, you know, they pl- they paid for the staff to go, and and it was going to be a big event. And after that ninety two loss, the Predators canceled it. And so that's what he was referring to. And you know, it was a big deal. Like I, I, I'll say this: it was a big, big deal internally. And you know, one of the things that I think kind of came up was. You know, they, they were going to be in Vegas on Sunday. I think it was going to be a day off. And they said, no, we're going to practice on Sunday now in Nashville because we're going right home. And there was that question about whether or not that's even allowed under the CBA because a day off is a day off. But there was nothing preventing the Predators from saying, you know what, we're not doing this. We're not doing the trip. And, you know, you heard Jennifer and Kelly and Kevin's position and and Jennifer and Kelly were against what they did and and Kevin supported it. And I think I'm with most people. I I agree with, I feel bad for the staff. Like those are the people that would also look forward to the trip and they would be included. I have to tell you, the response since we talked about that has been (laughs) really interesting Jeff, and the one thing that really stood out to me was someone called me and said, you know, you talked about the players, how they'd feel and why the team felt they did. And Barry Trotz, when I spoke to him, he was careful to say we don't have bad culture. But he said our standards had slipped below expectation. And he says when you have young players especially, you have to send them a message that you can't be rewarded if your standards and your preparation slips below your principles. And he said to me, particularly at home, and someone called me and he said, that's the part of the story you have to grab onto. He said, this is not about the Predators and their players. This is about the Predators and their fans. And he makes a great point. What is happening here is the Predators are going through a rebuild or a retool or whatever it is, and you are asking your fans to buy into that. You are asking your fans to believe in what you are trying to build. And what's Gord Stellick's famous line, Jeff? If you're going to stink, stink on the road. 
and what Barry Trotz, but he said what Barry Trotz is telling the fans and not only his players is we will not tolerate those efforts in front of our fans paying their money to see us play. And he said, that's what this story is really about. He said, yes, it's about losses and and the way they prepared and the fact they were terrible and the players are going to be mad and the Predators are going to have to deal with that, at least the players who are mad about it. But he said that what Trotz is really doing is sending a message to the fan base that if you buy a ticket to our game, we're going to demand the best out of our players. And, and I thought... That was really fascinating, and I wished I would have thought about that more on Saturday night. What do you think? I can honestly understand both sides. I do naturally, like you, default to the people that weren't on the ice that won't be able to go watch you two at the Sphere. Um, But ultimately, everyone's there because of the team and the players and winning hockey games and not getting starched at home and not having lackluster efforts, albeit against a team that may win the Stanley Cup and the Dallas Stars. But still, I think the main reason everybody is together in the first place is this team. And I under, I understand that. I get that. Like, I am I lean more towards you can't let it slip. That, you know, I think that, that Barry Trotz in this situation, as much as the Nashville Predators come off as harsh here, I think there comes every now and then where you have to, where you have to tighten the collars, and I'm I'm on board with with from a from a from a team point of view, which is why everybody's there in the first place. I'm on I'm on board with the Barry Trots. So, I, I wish my sisters listened to this podcast. I'm betting they don't, but I wish they did, uh, because my parents, when I was younger, they believed in this kind of punishment. Jeff, when we were kids. Who was one of the biggest stars in baseball? Oh, there were so many. I well, mean, think think 1977 World Series. Yes, Jeff and I are old. Reg, 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 Reggie Jackson. Okay, so there you go. Reggie Jackson. So in that year, he wasn't the best player, but he was the biggest, but he was very good. And he was the biggest star in the sport. Like Reggie Jackson was built for the social media era. If he played baseball now, it oh. would be nonstop around him. Hit a home run and got in a fight. Yeah, Remember that I one? <laughs> like I was actually looking at that video the other day. It is hilarious. It's so good. Against awesome. Cleveland, against John Denny. It's it's fantastic. It's so good. Oh my God, is that a great video? Deep right center. And that one is way gone. Look at Jackson. Today, the world would combust upon itself if that happened. Oh, it's so good. But Reggie Jackson 90, was the MVP of the 77 World Series. He hit three home runs on three swings in the clincher for the Yankees over the Dodgers. And he actually hit a home run in in game five. So I think he had home runs and four swings and four consecutive at-bats. Like, he was a massive star. And in 1978, they came to Toronto to play the Blue Jays, and my parents got me tickets, and I was so excited. Now, I can't remember what I did, but they sold the tickets. They called somebody up and sold the tickets right in front of me. Like, that was devastating to seven and a half year old Elliot. And another time they caught me lying. Didn't turn you, didn't, didn't turn you off sports though. <laughs> no, they sure made, tried. Made it worse. <laughs> yeah. And another time they caught me lying and I can't remember what I lied about and they canceled my birthday party. Now, to be honest, I'm a bit antisocial, so that didn't bother me too much, but losing the Reggie Jackson tickets sure did. My parents were very, very much like that. They were, if you step out of line, and unfortunately I stepped out of line a few too many times, they came after me with serious punishments. So when this when when this came out this week, I was like reliving childhood trauma. But <laughs> you know, like I like I, I like the thing is, Jeff, like like I was really torn on this one. Uh, I, I really was. 
but at the end of the day, uh, especially because as, as, as you and Kelly and Jen said, there are staff members here that were really being rewarded. Um, but I do understand that you're here to do a job and you, you have to do, you have to do the job. Yes. Um, speaking of do the job, we're going to do our emails and phone call job here in a couple of moments. And also a little bit later on, you'll hear from Kyle Connor and Connor Hellebuck from the Winnipeg Jets, who are part of one of the best games we saw this weekend, Winnipeg for Vancouver two in a thriller on Hockey Night in Canada on Saturday. But up first, up next, Montana's thought line. I'm going there. Listen to the 32 Thoughts podcast ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Here we are once again, the Montana's Thought Line, Montana's Barbecue and Bar, Canada's home for barbecue, Elliot. Try the ribs. 32 thoughts at sportsnet.ca, one 311 Say it slower, dummy, so people can write it down or remember it. 32 thoughts at sportsnet.ca, one 311 is the phone line. Uh, Jake By the way, did you hear Ron's favorite segment? I heard that yesterday, and he said we would talk about it later. I'm curious his observations on the thought line. So look forward to that from uh, from Ron. Uh, what Jake that means is he doesn't it. like listening to me and you and thinks we have no good ideas, <laughs> so he appreciates the audience for doing it. He, he skips over A block and goes right to B, and that's <laughs> the only thing that matters to Ron McClain. Enough of these two bozos and them for their <laughs> flapping lips. Let's get to uh, people like Jake and Mississauga. We'll start there. Uh, hello, Dom and the other two guys on the podcast. Is this from Ron in Oakville? Uh, this is, oh, no, it's Jake from Mississauga. I have a question about how teams, how teams pay players who are under contract with them as a player, but due to injury, they are no longer able to play, but now find themselves working for the team in another capacity. Example, Jake Muzzin currently working as a scout for the Maple Leafs, but is still under contract as a player for this season. Do they pay them an additional salary, one for the money they are owed as a player, and now additional salary for the other job with the team, or... Are they paid the one player salary and that's all? Here's my favorite part of the email. <clears throat> Keep up the great work, gentlemen. Also, Jeff, as a current University of Guelph student, I just wish to thank you for being great and insightful knowledge of the podcast, unlike people who attended Western. Well done, Jacob <laughs> Mississauga. Yes. <laughs> This question is disqualified, and I refuse to answer. He's, Elliot is uh, answering this under protest. <laughs> under protest, that's right. I'm going to take it up with the commissioner upon <laughs> appeal. Um, the answer is they just get their regular salary. There's no additional salary uh, or anything like that. You just get your regular salary. And, you know, sometimes it's paid out by insurance um, unless you suffer an injury that you cannot be insured for, like a player who's got a lot of hip injuries or... Uh, something like that, but it would be paid out on the regular salary. No additional monies collected. Okay. Good question. Really good. Bad one. location. Good question. No. Uh, excellent. Uh, excellent, excellent location uh, and excellent, excellent question. Okay, we move along. Uh, I love emails that are framed like this. This comes to us from Hames in Victoria. Greetings from Victoria, British Columbia, home of the Stanley Cup champion Cougars. Yes, that is very true. The Victoria Cougars, mm -hmm. back in 1925, beat the Montreal Canadiens three games to one. That's back when it was a best of five series. Great reference, Hames. Uh, here we go. It's about Phil Kessel. Phil Kessel coming to Vancouver. Okay to skate and talk to the Canucks got me thinking about PTOs during the regular season. Specifically, can a UFA like Kessel sign a PTO and practice with the team? Could he play an actual game or two with the team? What are the limits when it comes to a mid-season tryout? Love the pod, try the ribs. Hames from Victoria. You have to sign an actual contract. You can't play in the NHL under, unless you are an emergency goalie, like, say, a Zamboni driver who has to play in a game because two other goalies get injured. You have to be signed to an NHL contract to be eligible to play in a game. So, um, you know, Phil Kessel could not sign an ATO and then dress. He has to be signed to an NHL contract. You know, there's another exception, for example. Um, in the American Hockey League, you'll see some players 
who have not yet signed with their NHL teams. They're either junior or NCAA season ends and they sign what's called an ATO to play in the AHL. Yep. And their NHL contract doesn't start until the next season. That can happen. But for you to play in an NHL game, you cannot sign under a tryout agreement. You have to sign a contract for the rest of the year. Excellent. Uh, let's get to a voicemail. Let's hear from Sean in Edmonton. My question is about uh, suspensions uh, with all the controversy behind this Morgan Riley suspension and, well, you know, every suspension. Why doesn't the Department of Player Safety just have a set of guidelines? So, you know, making up numbers here, you know, a hit to the head is two games and a hit to the head with intent to injure is three games. If it happens at the last minute of a game, it's another game. Why isn't there a visible, and I think maybe that's the most important, a visible set of rules so that people can at least have a better understanding of why calls are made? I think this is a good question, and I think it's a question that a lot of people would agree with. Um, you know, I, I think the simplest answer is I've talked about this with various members of the Department of Player Safety throughout the year, and the answer is that they want some latitude for situations that they feel are more or less harsh than previous situations. And they want that ability to make a call depending on the circumstances of the game. Like, for example, let's look at the Morgan Riley. If you look at the Riley suspension and the video, um, that cross check was penalized much more seriously than other cross checks that cause damage. Um, you know, for example, I, I had talked with Jeff in the past about if it was a ride up, as Riley's was, it connects with the arm first and then goes up, it tends not to be punished more seriously. And if you watch the video, they make a point of saying that, yes, this is a ride up, but we consider this more serious. And so I think if that situation had been set, where there was a certain number of games they could give it because it was on a list, maybe they couldn't have punished Riley as seriously. So the Riley suspension, I think, is a perfect example of why the league doesn't want that situation. Because it was a write-up, it didn't cause an injury, Greg played the next day. You could look at something like that and say, okay, historically, that's only one or two games, maybe three, but in this particular case, because it was revenge, there were so many mitigating circumstances. Revenge, ride up, um, not a hockey play, after the whistle, no injury. Like there are four or five different pieces to this. And I would bet in if you placed it under a, a set of rules, it probably would come in under five games. So while I think a lot of people would agree with the overall question, it doesn't allow bending for the circumstance, I don't think. I would also say this. The Department of Player Safety feels they are much more consistent than they get credit for. I don't know if I would go that far. I, I see some things I look at and I'm like, okay, I'm not sure about this like every other person. But I do think there is generally a thread through a lot of suspensions. Sometimes they are more or less harsh than I'm expecting. But if you take a look at um, the kinds of things that connect together, there is something there. I think the other thing this year that's thrown everything kind of off a little bit is the three appeals now to situations that don't go to an independent arbitrator. And I'll tell you something. I had someone say to me last night, and this is someone who definitely has pro player leanings. He actually said to me last night, he was wondering if Batman would actually increase a suspension to get the players association to stop doing this. And, you know, I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, I really don't because then that could bring the arbitrator into it. But I thought it was interesting. Could you appeal then twice? Appeal the first when it goes up, and then you appeal again because now yes. it's over five games. Yes, you could do the you could do the appeal twice then. Yes, but I I I could understand just on a sort of on a gut level. This is another appeal that's before a Gary Bettman um, of five games five games or less. Him just saying, "Oh, you don't like it? Okay, fine. 
Here's two nickels. It's a 10-game suspension now. I, like I said, the fact that the PA are challenging these and more often, and, you know, my personal opinion is you it's it's built into the CBA, so you have the right to 100%. do what, what you see fit. But Bettman does have the ability to raise the suspension. And someone was saying to me last night that they were they were wondering if Bettman was going to do this just as a message to get the Players Association to stop doing it. But, you know, I doubt in this case that's going to happen. Offer sheets are also in the CBA, Elliot, and we know how those things are yes, treated. Yes, but they are. Or at least we have seen those <laughs> periodically. Okay, but here's another thing that I wonder about, too, that I think, and we saw this with the Morgan Riley. This is a really good, Sean in Edmonton, thanks, because it leads to a lot of different areas. Um, the sort of cross-generational context for a lot of these suspensions, too, because, listen, Dale Hunter trended right away after Morgan Riley on Ridley Gregg. Um, and that was 1993. And then there was the 1987 incident with Dave Brown and Thomas Sandstrom. You know, there was, I mean, the Hunter one was significant. Rafi Torres has had a number of significant suspensions as well. The Dave Brown was 15 on Thomas Sandstrom. Um, that was a different era. Is it safe to say that that was the era where those group of general managers wanted the game called officiated suspended one very specific way and now it's different which then leads into the question of how would you feel the department of player safety one season just said we're resetting everything and this is the new standard do you think they could do that elliot that's a great question it, it is like at different times over the years jeff they have talked about do they have to make changes to the way they do it? Like at one time there was an argument, should it be independent? Um, you know, I've heard, and, and uh, so someone said to me, they heard Vincent Domfus talk about it on a French uh, TV show that, and Vincent Domfus, like he was a member of the NHLPA executive. This is somebody who was incredibly involved in, uh, in, in union activities. Um, he has argued that, he doesn't like the fact that the NHLPA advocates for both the uh, the fouled player and the player who did the fouling. And he thinks that just puts the NHLPA in a terrible position and they should recuse themselves. And I've talked about that with others before and in the Players Association, and they disagree because they think the player needs it's like it's like law. Somebody has to be a defense attorney, right? So you need the NHLPA in there to advocate for the player. But it's an, just the fact that Dom Foos was so involved in the union as, as when he when he played. I think I think that's a really interesting perspective. Um, I think what you'd almost have to do, Jeff, is you'd have to get an agreement from the PA, though, that they're not going to appeal anything. Or you have to have a, an understanding between the two over what the new guidelines are. You almost would have to have, in that case, I think, a set of penalties. Because if not, you could appeal everything. You could say, well, that's not the way you used to do it. That isn't what the precedent is based on. I think you'd almost have to agree to that in advance. You know, the one thing about Dale Hunter, that particular suspension too, that was Bettman's first one. He wanted to come in and show that this wasn't going to happen under his watch. It's kind of similar to Brandon Shanahan, right? When Shanahan came in as the NHL chief justice, he was hammering people left and right. I remember Glenn Healy coming in remember and doing about it. Remember how GMs reacted? Oh, yeah, they were furious. <laughs> but, like, I remember Glenn Healy on air going, eight games for you, six games for you, <laughs> ten games for you. Like, it was – and and eventually it got dialed back. I could – I'm doing – I wish you could do a Glenn Healy impression because I can imagine Healy – I'm just hearing Healy's voice saying that and I can't help but laughing at it. That's oh, so good. It was so funny. <laughs> He looked like Dance Fever. He was pointing in every direction. Oh, I can imagine. Uh, Sean in Edmonton, thanks for that one. That leads to a, a lot of fertile ground. Let's get to, this is an interesting one. John in Cincinnati. Okay. Gentlemen, and yes, I mean all three of you. Well, we have you fooled. Ja, <laughs> here's John's intro. Grew up in Buffalo. am a tortured but dedicated Sabres fan. Have lived in Cincinnati for 40 years. Go Stingers. I miss the Ducks. 
Go Reds. We're all excited here in Cincinnati for our new NHL franchise. <laughs> oh, Gary Bettman did mention Cincinnati. That's good. I like that. Yeah. My question is, might there be something in the Blue Jackets franchise agreement that would keep the NHL out of Cincinnati or, for that matter, Cleveland? I believe that in the Sabres franchise agreement, there's something that says there can't be another NHL franchise within X miles, maybe 75, and that has helped to keep a franchise out of Hamilton, Ontario. Do other franchises have similar prohibitions? When we get our team, you guys have to come here and try our ribs. Thanks. That is John in hmm. Cincinnati. Whoo. That is a big one. That is a whopper. Well, the answer call. the answer is yes. There are agreements, sort of. Remember how much trouble Eugene Melnick got on primetime sports for talking about territory and the Ottawa Senators? Yes, yes. Why don't you you should refresh everybody's? So on that. that was uh, Eugene Melnick in conversation with uh, with Bob McCowan uh, talking about how, how the Ottawa Senators had their territory and all teams have their territory and almost sort of presenting it as sort of like little fiefdoms around North America, which, you know, any legal legal uh, scholar would look at and say, hmm, that is troublesome. Um, and that led Eugene Malnick. I, I'm not sure whether he, he, he did a retraction to it or a clarification, mind you, but I do remember that that raised a lot of eyebrows, the idea of, I mean, it's a, it's a non-competitive stance, right? It's essentially artificially keeping people out of a marketplace. So I, I know that Eugene gotten some some hot water over that one. But look, everybody understands there is something. Like I, I remember when the, when the Mighty Ducks of Anaheim came into the league, Bruce McNall, their franchise fee, I think, was $50 million, and the Kings got half of it. And so I remember, I remember reading, and I wasn't around at this time, but I remember reading stories and hearing in the past that, you know, Bruce McNall had to sell the other owners on the fact that $25 million was going to the league and $25 million was going to him. So there are understandings about what you can do and... I think the NHL is also uniquely attuned to how other teams in your area would affect your business. Like to me, the, the return of the Quebec Nordiques, it's not about whether or not Quebec City can handle a team. It's about how would that team affect the business of the Montreal Canadiens. And I believe that. That's my belief. It's... They would just have a, a huge effect on the Canadians' business. Why isn't there a team in Hamilton or in that area? And people have talked about it. It's because how would that affect the business of both the Buffalo Sabres and the Toronto Maple Leafs? Like one thing I think the NHL would like to see and has talked about it on and on in the past is a third team in the Scotiabank Arena. So it's it's like LA. You have two they have two basketball teams and a hockey team. Yeah, reverse. I think the NHL would love to have two hockey teams and a basketball team in Toronto. But one of the things you talk about is how does that affect the business? So whether it's official or unofficially official, mm -hmm. th these things are absolutely in the forefront of what a league is thinking it's a great question um i'll remind people that when the new york islanders joined the nhl the new york rangers received a territory fee uh from that organization i think it was five six maybe even as much as 10 million dollars back in the in the early 70s when the islanders were uh allowed in to the uh to the national hockey league great question there put it this way that is a question ellie you can probably do an entire pod not just podcast but podcast series on uh, we didn't give it enough concert because of the authority of time here on this pod, but that is a great question, and that's one that leads into a, um, an enormous discussion. Uh, so thank you for that, and thanks to everybody who submitted questions, either at 32 thoughts at sportsnet.ca or the thought line 1-833-311-3232, the Montana's thought line, Montana's Barbecue and Bar, Canada's home for barbecue. We're back in a moment. Welcome back.
back to the podcast, 32 Thoughts, presented as always by the GMC Sierra. And coming up here, you're going to hear from a couple of Winnipeg Jets. And wasn't that a great game on Saturday? Even if you're a Vancouver Canucks fan and it was in your own barn, you have to admit the Rick Tockett versus Rick Bonus game delivered. And a couple of players who always deliver, Kyle Connor, you're going to hear from him, and Connor Hellebuck as well. Our good friend Joey Kenbert from Vancouver uh, texted me this morning, Sunday, and made a good point about Connor Hellebuck. Lifetime against the Vancouver Canucks. Hellebuck is now 14-4-0. Save percentage, 941, 1.73 goals against, and has the best save percentage against the Vancouver Canucks of any goaltender in NHL history. You'll hear from Connor Hellebuck, but up first, Kyle Connor of the Winnipeg Jets. You know, when a, when a player misses as much time as you have this year, sometimes when they take a step back and watch the game, they learn things. With your time off, with your injury, did you learn anything new either about your team, the game, the league, anything? Um, yeah, I think I learned a lot about our team, just the resilience, um, you know, just the overall selflessness of everybody on that team to you know kind of come together and you know I wasn't the only one to kind of get injured throughout that yeah. that run as well we've had guys and it just seemed like it was a next man up mentality and it was incredible to watch um you know winning games in different types of ways goaltending defense you know different guys stepping up scoring game winning goals and um you know those guys really came together as a team and you know you felt that even a couple games I came back before the break it's you know it felt like even beginning of the season you know with obviously Mark and and Connor committing with those contracts too, it, it almost you know rejuvenated everybody in that room. Who impressed you on your team? And it's kind of like a weird question because you right. play with them, but like when you stand back and watch them. And you could also say who was total garbage. If you <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think Gabe Velarde really impresses me. You know, obviously new face coming in, yeah. only seen a handful of times. You know, we played the Kings with him over there. Um, wasn't really sure what to expect. And, you know, the way he wins battles and the way he controls his body and, you know, fends off defender, he's really tough to get off the puck. And he controls it really well. And it seems like he dangles somebody every game. Like, he's got really in tight hands. and um, Heavy stick, right? Heavy stick. Like, he's, he's just, like, a strong, smart player in that way. Like, he's really good down low on that power play in front. Um, so, like, those little, you know, skill sets impress me a lot. I always get a good laugh whenever players uh, spend some time out of the lineup. They they come back and they say, no wonder you guys are so hard on us. The game looks so easy from up there, right? <laughs> yeah. Like it, it, I always get a good laugh out of players because they always say, it's always so much easier up there. It's totally different game down low. What's the biggest thing you look at when you watch a game from up high and say, it's so much different than what it actually appears to be up here? Yeah, it does. I mean, you see the game in a different you know, through a different lens where, you know, plays may come to you a lot easier. You know, you're watching the game and, you know, it looks obvious in, in certain scenarios. And, um, you know, that, that being said, when you're on the ice and things move a lot faster, it's a different perspective. You don't have a bird's eye view over top and, you know, seeing the outlets, seeing the different, you know, defensive positioning by players where they should be. And, you know, it, yeah, it could be eye opening. Sometimes it helps for a guy too that's you know could be struggling in the lineup you know, to to sit back and take watch a game from the stands like that. Um, I've known I've known teams do that uh, a couple of times with with players just to get a different perspective. But um, you know, overall, it's it, the biggest thing. It was it was tough for me to yeah. you know, as anybody just to watch and and not want to play too. Like you get in those close games and you want to be a difference maker and. Uh, that was another challenge for sure. Hellebuck had a great line just now. He's, we're talking about you guys and him, you and him being on different teams here. And I said, is, is Kyle going to score on you in this? And he goes, he knows not to shoot glove. It's just a waste <laughs> of time. What, what do you think about that? I'm trying to create some inter, inter-team toughness. Yeah, way to wreck the Jets, Elliot. <laughs> yeah. So he's, I mean, I shoot on him all the time in the summer too. And if he gets one glove save, he'll be th flashing that thing for the next 20 minutes and chirping you. So <laughs> like just like yeah, raising it? Like, just raising it, letting you know that he got you. Um, and he's also the guy, I mean, you come down, you shoot a little high, he starts chirping you. Or like he's he's a very vocal goaltender, even in practice. And um, so, I mean, that's, you know, as a shooter coming down, you want to go high glove on him every time. So <laughs> it's almost of him baiting you too. So, mm -hmm. um, but that, I mean, 
that being said, I think I, if there's anybody that knows a couple spots on him, it's me. <laughs> so we'll see. <laughs> you know, I get the impression that he's like, it's almost like with him, it's like Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. Like when he's talking to us here, he's pretty calm and mellow. But I guess when he's on the ice, he's a bit of an animal, eh? Yeah. Yeah. He's, I mean, he takes his game very seriously in a sense. You know, he's, he's one of the hardest working, like, uh, goaltenders as as far as video you, know, you can talk to him to a play like I'll be looking um, someone will score in a certain spot on him and you know you ask him and he's he's so in depth he thinks he should save every single puck mm. which is just like the confidence that he has um, and just the work that he's put in um, and he, you know he's very very motivated which I think he kind of sets a tone for a team honestly you know the goaltender like that um, you know you never know how much of a leadership a goaltender has in their room but he's he's a big part of it for too. You know, scoring goals is hard. You know that. Um, but you seem to do it. I don't want to say easily because I don't want to I don't want to insult you. I know how hard it is to score goals. How much do you change what you do every year knowing that I mean, team's game plan, like don't let this guy shoot? How much do you change every year or what do you work on? Every yeah, year? it's uh, it's a combination of a, a lot of different things. I mean, I try to work on because you never know what that, you know, how a game's going to play out, how a situation's going to play or a defender's going to adjust to you. So, I mean, it's just continuing the work that I've always done since I turned pro, just getting a lot of different reps at di receiving pucks different ways, um, you know, working on a quick release, uh, tips. Like, you got to be so versatile in this league to score goals too. It's like you said, defenders are so, so good these days that they'll adjust, so you, you gotta change. Will you work on, I'm curious about one thing specific, will you work on shooting after receiving really bad passes? Oh yeah, yeah, that's, everybody does that. I mean, it's. That I, is I your mean, thing. I, yeah. <laughs> oh, listen, I'm a, I'm a horrible passer in, in, in my beer league, so I, I know. Yeah. We could all use a guy like you, like I can throw anything to, to Kyle Connery, yeah, he's fine with it. Yeah, I you mean, can't I give would, a good player like a bad to... pass, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's definitely a skill set. You never know, it's could, you know, it could be a perfect, perfect pass and you know it bounces off someone's a defender stick obviously yep you know try and tip it and you got to be able to knock it out of the air get it off quick um so there's tons of little you know drills i guess tricks you can practice and it's all repetition all getting comfortable you know you've seen this before and um and trying to get it off as quick as you can thank you for your time always appreciate it yeah, thanks guys alongside the stylish connor hellebuck the first thing we noticed right away were the uh the slips very nice, very stylish. Have you ever been described as a fashion plate, Connor Hellebuck? <laughs> no, <laughs> never, and I, uh, I don't think I ever want to be. <laughs> it's not my style. Well, listen, uh, your style is winning uh, right now. You know, uh, thinking about, you know, what are we going to talk about with Connor Hellebuck? And you know, one of the obvious questions is, are things great or really great, both for your team and you? How do you explain this success, personally and from the team point of view? Uh, well, for personally, I don't think my game has changed a whole lot. It's just continuing to grow is with experience. Um, but the, the main part of all my success has been my teammates and the way they've been defending in our end and, and really buying into our team system. It makes things all very predictable for me. And when you can be predictable, you can really get ahead of the game. And uh, that's kind of right up my alley is I like mm -hmm. to stay ahead of it at all times and know what's going to happen. So the guys have been playing so good in front of me that has made my life a lot easier. There was a lot, Rick Bonus has talked a lot lately about that trade and how it affected your decision to stay, the Dubois deal uh, in Winnipeg. Was that the biggest thing in the offseason that convinced you the Jets were the right place for you? You know, it definitely helped. I had a really good chat with Chevy, uh, the GM, just before camp started about where the team's mentality's at. And he really drove home that he's there to win a cup. And it's not just a year or two, it's it's when I'm there, it's cup time. And my main whole purpose of, I mean, I guess you can call them rumors, but my whole purpose of taking the summer to really be patient and taking information was where can I personally win a cup? And trade helped. Um, you can see the direction of the team. But, you know, I've always believed in that room, and the room's been solid. And we even showed it last year that we can be really good. It was just, it's just been really hard mentally going into every first round and getting knocked out so quickly. And and I know there's the pandemic year. We went to the second round, but then we got swept. And, you know, that takes a toll on a player, especially when you think your team deserves more and is better than they're showing. So I just took some time, kind of collected information and made a, the right decision for me, and it's paid off so far. It sure has. And, you know, one thing, like you're a really cerebral guy, 
And I'm wondering when you're in that conversation with Kevin Sheldayoff, what questions are you asking? Because I'm betting you're asking pretty pointed questions. So, like, what are you asking him? Yeah, so that's that's a hard line because I don't want too much information about the team and the business side of things. Well, we do. So you yeah, got you do. Exactly. You, be. you agreed to this interview, so you got to cough it up. Yeah. So word for word. Hell of a buck, let's go. <laughs> our conversations would be very different. Um, uh-huh. Mine was, um, where's the direction? Where's your mentality at? of the direction of this team. And if I sign now, two years from now, you're going to realize, well, we should have rebuilt and rebuilt. And then I'm stuck in a rebuild. And from everything I was gathering, it wasn't. Um, and I mean, you have to give them a tip of the cap. So for the last I don't know, seven years, we've been a competitive team mm-hmm. we've been in playoffs every year. And there's not many teams that can say that. So he's done a good job up to this point. Uh, me obviously being the player I am, I'm competitive and want more. <laughs> Always mm-hmm. want more and more and more, even though he we have had a chance pretty much every year except for one. So you kinda have to kinda take those into perspective too. That we do have a good team and the pieces are there. We just maybe a little trade helps and maybe a coach helps. Little pieces continue to help and now I'm old enough to have a bit of a voice in there. You've been part of some really good Winnipeg Jets teams. Is this the best Jets team you've been part of? This is the most structured and defensive team we've ever put on the ice. Uh, everyone kind of knows their role and is ha- happy with the role. Mm-hmm. And it's a really good dynamic in the room. Um, if guys get more, they can play with the more and, and the um, whatever they're asked to do, they can do it. They're willing to do whatever it takes to win. And, uh, you know, those teams are extremely rare to have a whole team that's bought into that. Mm-hmm. Who uh, who on your blue line do you think doesn't get enough love out there? Oh, man, I think the whole blue line's incredible. I mean, you could say Josh Morrissey, but he gets I love. feel like he gets a lot of love. He gets love. And he deserves every second yeah. of it. But I think he might even deserve a little bit more. Um, Dylan DeMello. You could probably say, because he's just been so solid defensively. And no one really talks about the defensive side too much because they like the points and the numbers and Mm -hmm. the statistics for uh, D-men. But I think he's a really solid shutdown guy that doesn't get talked about enough. You're sitting there on Thursday night. McDavid and Dreisaitl and Will Arnett have a pick. And you hear your name in the first round. Were you surprised? Yeah, I almost didn't even stand up because I thought someone might have said the wrong name. <laughs> took me a second to process. Wait, I actually just got called first round. So, yeah, that was pretty cool. Uh, the whole experience, I think the fans liked it. And uh, I really enjoyed being in a white jersey. I think those are the best of the four. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it'll be a fun event. Did you have a side bet with Kyle Connor over who was getting picked first? And did you rub it in his face yeah. he went before <laughs> he did? No, I'm actually sad that we're not on the same team. Uh, this, our schedules are going to be a little different. We're probably, maybe even going to be in different locker rooms, which kind of stinks, but, you know, it'll be fun. You know all this stuff. He's not going to score on you, is he? Well, he knows not to shoot on my gloves, so that re- removes half the net. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't want to get embarrassed like that. <laughs> um, on a scale of 1 to 10, how much do the Winnipeg Jets despise the Minnesota Wild? <laughs> 15. 20? You can go higher than 10 if you want. <laughs> Well, it's hard to say because I feel like we've had the last blow in playoffs against them. And ever since then, it's kind of the same game every time we go to Minnesota. It's hard, a lot of hitting, fast-paced, low-scoring game. And that kind of builds rivalries. And, I mean, they're so close. We get, Sometimes we get preseason against them, and, and you see them quite a bit. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know if we, we absolutely hate them. But it's Looks definitely like it's definitely a rivalry. <laughs> it's not something that we're going You're not in fooling there. anyone yeah. here, Connor. We're not going in there and saying, oh, we're going to go have point night. This is going to be a fun night. Yeah. This is, it's one of those, you're going in, and this is going to be a grind, and we're going to have fun doing it. Yeah. Um, I'm sure, like, obviously, Minnesota is one of the teams you circle on the calendar. Who else do you circle? I like playing in Nashville. Nashville's a really fun barn to play in. Mm-hmm. Um, Dallas, I really like Dallas. I really, I'm just naming off all these central division teams but you like this you like one time zone eh? i like one one time zone no i i think the barns are good and then anytime that i can get an off day and go fishing in the in the way city is really 
uh, like a little cherry on top. Okay, so we got to go, but uh, where's the best fishing spot in the NHL? Uh, I mean, you should say Florida, but I'm going to say Dallas. Because just outside of Dallas, about an hour, you have a couple big lakes. And there's Lake Fork. It's an hour and a half. There's Ray Roberts. That's, I believe, just an hour. Texoma is probably 45 minutes to an hour. And known for its bass fishing. And I, me, I played in Texas, and I really like the people in Texas. And yep. I like the dynamic that there's a really nice city. And then just outside of it, it's suburbs, kind of how I grew up. And just it's a good feel. That's great. Thanks so much for this. Good luck in the second half. Thank you. There you go. Cal Connor, Connor Hellebuck, a pair of Connors. Hope you enjoyed those interviews. Those were both recorded around All-Star Weekend. Uh, with that, we'll let you go. Uh, thanks so much for listening once again. Monday is a holiday stateside President's Day, so that means eight afternoon games. Enjoy them. Podcast returns Friday morning. Friday morning.